So yesterday we talked a little bit about the structure of the cell membrane and we talked about things passing through the membrane and how diffusion was the movement of things from higher to lower concentrations. So today we're going to continue and we're going to talk about osmosis. So membranes, remember, are selectively permeable, meaning only some things can pass through them and they don't let everything through. Um, as a matter of fact, most things cannot easily pass through the membrane. Oxygen and carbon dioxide can pass through, water can pass through, but ions, things with charges cannot, large uh, polar molecules cannot. And so really, a lot of times, we determine what's going to happen to a cell based on osmosis, because the solutes are sort of stuck where they are, and we want to know which way the water is going to go. So osmosis is the movement of water from higher to lower concentrations through a membrane. Again, a lot of times when other things cannot pass through, the water can. And so in the next situations, we're going to look at what happens if water can pass through the membrane, but the solutes cannot. So there's a word for this. Um, it's, it's called tonicity. Tonicity has to do with the concentration of the solution. So a hypertonic solution is a more concentrated solution. Uh, to clarify, that would mean that's a solution that has more solute dissolved in it, a higher concentration of dissolved substances. Hypotonic is less concentrated, so it has less solute. And then isotonic would be where you have the two solutions equally concentrated. Now, you only use these words when you're comparing two sides, just to clarify. You wouldn't say, is this a hypertonic or a hypotonic solution? That question doesn't even make sense. That's like saying, are, am I taller or shorter? That doesn't make sense. Am I taller or shorter than who? I have to be comparing, right? And the same thing is true here. So a 10% sugar solution is not hypertonic or hypotonic, but if I had a 10% sugar solution, and then I said that inside the cell is a 5% solution of solutes, now I could ask that question. Out here, this would be hypertonic because it has more solute, and this would be hypotonic because it has less solute. So you, one side would be hyper, and the other side would be hypo. And there's a rule, and you should just memorize the rule. Water will always go towards the hypertonic side. So if solute can't pass but water can, water's going to go towards the side, in or out of the cell, whichever side, has more solute. And it will sort of be trying to dilute it. Not on purpose, it's sort of a natural process. And this push from the hypertonic side um, is called osmotic pressure. So let's take a look at a practice problem. So in this situation, which side Oh, let's see. So they want to know which side of the selectively permeable membrane is hypertonic. So the red dots are sugar and the blue dots are water. So your answer would be that the hypertonic side would be the left because it's got more solute. So this side would be hypertonic and the other side would be hypotonic. Again, hypertonic and hypotonic are always talking about the solute, not the water. Remember, water's the solvent. Second question, if the sugar cannot pass and only water can pass, which way will the water go? And the answer is the water, and they've kind of already got arrows here, is going to go to the left. Why? Because it's going to go, number one, you can just memorize, it's going to go to the hypertonic side, but isn't it true that's the side with less water? More sugar means less water, so the water's going to go to that side. And so what will happen is the water level would go up on this side, and the water level would go down on this side, and it would actually look like this. So notice how what's happening is now you have more water molecules moving towards this side. And in theory, gravity would play a role and stop this from happening. There'd be a membrane here, by the way, just to clarify. There's a membrane between these two sides um, that's preventing the, water, the sugar from going through and allowing the water. Eventually, I mean, it's not going to be enough that it's going to keep going until the water spills over the top. Gravity does eventually play a role in this. But imagine, even though there's more sugar on the side, isn't it true that if most of the water left the other side, that eventually it looked like this, and just a little bit on this side, 
you could have the sugar equally spread out on both sides. Even though there's more sugar molecules, their concentration, the percentage of sugar, could be the same. So here's a couple more. First one, identify hyper and hypotonic sides. Which way will the water go and what will happen to the cell? So we're pretending like the dissolved particles cannot move, only water can move. Right? So I'm looking at the picture. I see that there's a higher concentration of dissolved particles inside the cell. So inside is going to be hyper. That makes outside hypo. Our rule is if only water can pass, water will go into the cell because it's going to basically try to dilute that cell. And this cell would actually swell up. In fact, it might even explode. So our answer here would be that the cell would swell or maybe even burst. All right, our second situation. So it looks like what they're trying to show here is that the concentration is equal on both sides. Even though there's more black dots outside, they're spread out evenly. So they're trying to show equal concentrations. So this would be called isotonic because both sides have equal amounts of solute and water would go both directions. Be careful on this one. The cell would stay the same, but don't put, if this was like a free response question, don't put that water wouldn't move. Remember, this is random motion. Water, the water is always moving. The molecules are moving around, just like the molecules in the air and the molecules in any liquid are moving around. So, But the amount going in and out would be equal. And in our last situation, they're trying to show here, this looks more concentrated, right? More, uh, the dots are closer together. So this would be our hypertonic side. This would be our hypotonic side. And our rule is that water will go towards the hyper, so this cell would shrink. All right, and maybe it would be helpful if we do this with some percents. So let's look here. So notice here, they've actually written the percentages of water and solute to kind of show you. So imagine that the, you couldn't see the water. You could figure it out, right? Because they have to add up to 100. So 55% solute, that's how they're getting that the other 45% is water. But we don't even need to see the water to answer the question. If I just cross this out and I say which side is hypertonic, remember, if you know the rules, you don't have to write down how much water there is. The hypertonic side is the side with more solute. So this is going to be hyper, this is going to be hypo, and water would go in. Let's look at our second scenario. Again, they told us how much water there was, but you really don't have to even know that. Although it may be helpful, let me back up for a second. Let me just comment, let me erase this. Maybe this does help you understand a little better. So if there's more water, remember water's actually going from where there's more to where there's less. So the reason water goes in is because the water's going to the area with less water. But if they didn't give you these numbers, you could calculate them, but you really don't have to, because if you just memorize it's gonna to go to the hypertonic side, you'll always get the right answer. But technically, the hypertonic side, the reason that water goes that way is because there's less water on that side. Look at our second scenario. Which side is hypertonic? The side with more solute. So that would be out here. So the outside here would be hyper. In here would be hypo. And which way will water go? Water always goes towards hyper, so the water would go out. And as a backup, notice the water is going from where there's more water to where there's less water. Let's look at our third scenario. So here they did not give us the percentages of water. So we don't need them, to be honest, right? If only water can pass, we know it's going to go to the hypertonic side. That's the side with more solute. There's 20% outside, there's 10% inside. So outside is hyper, inside is hypo, and water will go out. And if we want to verify this, this would be 80% water, this would be 90% water, and yep, Water's going from where there's more water to where there's less water. And our last scenario, again, they didn't give us the water, but you don't need it. Inside is hyper, because it has more solute. Outside is hypo, because it has less solute. Therefore, water should go in. You want to verify it. Is water going to where there's less water? Absolutely. 70% water out here, 60% water in here. Yep, the water's going from where there's more water to where there's less water. All right, so that's how you solve these. Now, if you're asked, really quick, if they tell you the solute can pass and they want to know which way the solute will go, remember, anything that can pass goes from where there's more of that thing to where there's less. So if the solute could pass 
and you had this problem here, and they say, hey, which way will the solute go? This was 40% solute inside and 30% solute outside. The solute would go out. But for these problems, we were assuming the solute was stuck where it was. But just keep that in mind. The diffusion, if, if a solute can pass, it will go from higher to lower concentrations. And this is just some examples. Red blood cells, for example, in an animal cell, in uh, an isotonic, or sorry, in a hypotonic solution, the cell will swell, might even burst. In a isotonic solution, the water is equal going in and out. And in a hypertonic solution, the cell would shrivel up. This can actually happen to your red blood cells if you got really dehydrated. Plant cell, on the other hand, is different. Remember, plant cells have a central vacuole and they have a cell wall. So even though water will go in in a hypotonic solution, just like it does in an animal cell, the plant cell won't explode. The plant cell will actually really like that. The plant cell will be healthy. Um, here, the plant cell will be somewhat stiff, but not as stiff as it could be. It says here normal. To be honest, plant cells kind of like to be in a hypotonic solution. And this is our opposite. This is a plant cell in a, like a saltwater solution hypertonic and the cell membrane shrivels up. We're actually going to do a, a lab and look at this with the Elodia plants that we have in the back. So how do cells deal with the problem of water balance? Well, we have some protists, single-celled like pond creatures, they have a contractile vacuole, looks kind of like a little flower, and what it does, they live in fresh water and as water comes in, because there's more water outside than inside, they can pump out the excess water. Multicellular organisms like us, we control our water by our hormones. Uh, like antidiuretic hormone is actually a hormone that helps to control our, our water balance. Vasopressin is another hormone that helps to control our water balance. If you drink more water, you pee more. If you drink less water, you pee less. So, you know, you control your water balance purposely. And the same is true with all multicellular organisms. And then plants, like I said, they actually love being in fresh water. They suck up the water, they create pressure, and that's almost like their skeleton is that pressure that they create. Here's some pictures. Here's red blood cell. Normal, this is in a uh, probably pure water, and this would eventually explode. And this third one is shriveling. That's what you're seeing here is it's actually shriveling up. This is the Elodia. We're going to actually look at this ourselves. Some really nice slides of this you're going to make yourself. This is what it would normally look like with all the chloroplasts and everything all spread out. You can't see it, but the vacuole would be full of water here. And then this is what we ha what happens to it when you put it in salt water. Notice how the cells are starting to shrivel, and you can actually get it to shrivel a lot more than that. So we'll look at that in the lab. Penicillin, actually, that's one of the ways that it works. It pokes holes in the cell walls of bacteria, and then the water flows in from high to low concentration. It actually causes the, um, the, the bacteria to burst. So that's, that's actually how penicillin works. Facilitated diffusion, sometimes things cannot get into the cell, but your cell still needs them. This is still moving things from high to low, and it does not require energy. But unlike regular diffusion, this is where molecules are going through uh, specific proteins in the cell membrane. This is still passive transport. No energy is needed. A good example of, of something that goes in your cells this way is glucose. Glucose goes into your cells, which need it for energy, by facilitated diffusion. To facilitate just means to help. So proteins in the membrane help carry things through because these are solutes that cannot pass through the phospholipid part. This is a picture of facilitated diffusion. Notice it's still going high to low, but um, it's going through here rather than simple diffusion would just be through the membrane itself. That's just another animation showing facilitated diffusion. And then active transport is when a cell needs to pump something against the normal direction, against the concentration gradient, we call that. And this does require energy. Um, and, it, and we use proteins in the membrane called pumps that physically using energy pump molecules through the membrane. So this, if you're looking in a picture and you have to identify active transport, look for the thing going from low to high, and also look for ATP because that's what our cells use for energy. So if you see ATP in the picture, that's definitely going to be active transport. And it's always low to high, like I said.
And the last thing here, these are some other types of active transport, endocytosis, where the cell actually surrounds and eats something, and exocytosis, it spits something out.